Good morning. Thanks for joining me again. Sorry, we cut out this morning. I was setting up all by myself over here and didn't set it up quite right. But open your Bibles to the book of Hosea. Hosea chapter 1. We're starting a new series called Minor Prophets, Major Blessing. And it's going to be taking one book of the Minor Prophets every single week. And we're going to take an overview of it and see what it has to teach us. On Wednesday, Emily made potatoes, sausage, and Brussels sprouts. Imagine if I would have eaten that meal and all that I ate was the sausage. She would have said, hey, why are you going to eat your potatoes and Brussels sprouts? And I said, oh, that's just a little bit too hard to chew on. She would say, no, all of it is made for your good. And there's an aspect where the Old Testament actually contains 77.2% of our Bible. And many times we shortchange ourselves because we avoid the Old Testament in order to just have what's easier to understand in the New Testament. A lot of the New Testament teaching is didactic, if you would. So it says, clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility. They're action statements. It's let brotherly love continue, pray without ceasing, all these action statements. But in the Old Testament, what we're given is narratives. And we have to think about and meditate on the text to begin to understand the timeless truths that are underneath them. It's actually interesting. There are two good verses to memorize as you and think about as you read the Old Testament. The first one is Romans 15, 4, which says, Whatever was written aforetime, the Old Testament, is written for our learning that we, through the patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. The Old Testament is meant to give you hope. But there's also the verse, 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17, which says that the, all Scripture, speaking of the Old Testament, because that's when it was written, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction in righteousness. And so the book of Hosea is going to give us doctrine about the glory of God, about who he is and how he relates to his people. It's going to give us reproof. It's going to say, hey, you have prostituted yourself. You have gone after other idols. It's going to give us correction. It's going to say, hey, this is how we turn back to God. And it's going to give us instruction in righteousness. Where do we go from here and how do we honor God? So God, take this time, second time recording the video, take it and use it for your glory to communicate to your people the word that you would have for them. Thank you for it not working before, because clearly you didn't want that message recorded. Thank you for the humility that you give us. Even just the pride that I can struggle with to have things go right the first time. Thank you for humbling me there. Thank you for um, Emily coming over and help and setting me up. And we thank you for technology that we can communicate, even though we're not able to gather here together. In Jesus' name, amen. When you open up the book of Hosea, it's kind of like reading a newspaper because the economy was absolutely booming. Things were taking off. They were under Jeroboam and the nation was prosperous. And if you look at Hosea chapter 10, Hosea chapter 10 teaches us that whenever we prosper, we are in the most danger of turning away from God. There's a verse in Proverbs that says, don't give me poverty or else I'll steal and define your, defile your name. And don't give me riches, or else I will think basically I have it all and I don't need you. And in Hosea chapter 10, verse 1, he says, Israel is a luxuriant vine that yields its fruit. The more its fruit increased, the more altars he built. As his country improved, he improved his pillars. And if you have any sort of retirement, you know that right now the economy is doing very, very well for your investments. If you have GameStop stock, you are doing very well. And you should probably sell it soon because it's not going to stay up there that long. It probably has already dropped down by now. But the economy was booming. And secondly, the government was corrupt. There are six kings in 30 years and four of them are assassinated. And it's no doubt in anyone's mind that there's governmental corruption. Both parties look at the other party and say, hey, you're corrupt. In 2016, he said, you're corrupt and you hacked with the election. And then in 2020, he said, oh, no, you're corrupt and you hacked the election. Well, imagine back at this time, they didn't hack elections. They just hacked kings. So four guys got assassinated. They got killed. And that's how a new man came to power. But also nationally, they claim to be one nation under God while they were living as one nation under themselves. 
And it's really convicting for me. Turn to Hosea chapter 4. Hosea chapter 4, a verse I quoted the last five weeks, was, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And I couldn't remember where that was, and then I read it here. And what's so convicting is that God is accusing the priests of not preaching as they ought and of going after other idols and of prostituting themselves. And 2020 was a big year of growth for me. I was challenged in many things. Many idols have been exposed and many more are being exposed even into 2021. And I think that one of the greatest revivals needed in the American church today is the revival of pastors. I see many pastors who are addicted to different substances, and most of it is stuff that seems harmless. Technology addiction, there's an interaction addiction, there's a constant desire to debate, to be on the right side of the argument, to have a say about everything. But many of us pastors, our souls are languishing because there's not a deep relationship with God. And so if you're joining us and you're not from St. Answer Baptist Church, I, I and if, church, I want you to pray this for me too, but please pray for your pastor to have a love for God and a deep relationship with him. We're just as tempted as anyone else to go after other idols, to go after the idols of sex, to go after the idols of money, to go after the idol of prosperity or, a, or of pleasure or of ease or of comfort or of anything. Even just the, the, the idol of knowledge that we're, seen as intellectual. But what we need today is men of God, men of the word, and men of prayer. And in Isaiah chapter 4, verse 6, it says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because you, priest, have rejected knowledge. I will reject you from being priest to me. And since you have forgotten the law of your God, I will forget your children. The more they, the more the priests increased, the more they sinned against me. And I will change their glory to shame. This problem was not a problem. It was not God's problem with the world. It was his problem with his people. But what does God do when his people turn his back on him? Big idea. The big idea for today is God lovingly pursues his backsliding people. God lovingly pursues his backsliding people. Backsliding is not a word that we use that often, but it's definitely a word that's being practiced today. And many of you, even as I was preparing this, and even as I was preaching the first time, <laughs> many of you came to mind. You're beginning to backslide. Wearsby defines backsliding as a gradual slipping away from the Lord into a worldly lifestyle that pleases us but grieves the Lord. And some of you are backsliding. The things of God are, they're not as sweet to you. Your time with God is rushed or non-existent at all. Your relationship with other people is hurting. You hurt them and you, know, you don't care for them. You're not submitting to them. You're not loving them. And I see many of our hearts are prone to backsliding. Even those of us who don't think we're backsliding, when we begin to look at Hosea, we see that there are many sins that we go after. But I want you to know that God lovingly pursues you. So if you're in the point right now where you say, I am backsliding from the Lord, I know it. What do I have to do? Start right now. Please just start right now. Don't look to yourself. Look to God and say, God, help me. God, my heart is going after other idols and I know that they are empty and worthless. It said of Moses that he denied the pleasures of sin for a season. So you have to get the understanding that sin that you are going after is going to be pleasurable. In fact, a good definition for sin is a lie wrapped in pleasure. It's a lie wrapped in pleasure. It's like a chocolate-covered cherry. You love the outside, but the inside is horrible. And then say, God, help me to see the lie that's wrapped in pleasure. I guarantee you, if you go after sin, it will delight you. If sin didn't delight us, we wouldn't do it. And if Gomer wasn't delighted in her prostitution, she would never have prostituted herself. But don't give up the long term for the short term. Let's look, though, at the book of Hosea. It's really a, a picture book. 
I read a lot of pictures, books to Elise, and I understand them very, very well. But I appreciate pictures, and God uses lots of pictures in this book. And so point number one is God's love pictured. And as we look at this, see yourself as Gomer. This is really a story of Israel and God. They had prostituted themselves. God had called them to be married to him, and they'd gone after other idols. And God's love is pictured, first of all, by point, point number A, or letter A, a wife of whoredom. It says in Hosea chapter 1, verse 2, when the Lord first spoke through Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, go take for yourself a wife of whoredom and have children of whoredom, for the land commits great whoredom. And so I, Gomer and Hosea's marriage is going to be a picture to Israel of their relationship with God. And it's a picture of many of your relationship with God too. Yeah, he, he married you. You're born again. You know that you're going to heaven, but your heart has begun to go after other things. And you're beginning to bear the fruit of whoredom or prostitution. I imagine it was very difficult for Go home, Hosea to walk through the marketplace to see his wife making eyes at guys. And then, you know, as the years went on, she'd be gone for a night. And then she'd be gone for two nights. And then she'd be gone for three nights. And I imagine that for him, that just was a gut punch. Where is she? Who's she with? But Gomer, she'd come back to Hosea and pretend like everything was good. I think many of us are guilty of doing that in our relationship with God. There are lots of pictures of Gomer in the book of Hosea, and I think they really connect us to the Christian life even. Hosea, or Gomer, is pictured as a prostitute. And the thing about a prostitute is that she's for hire, but she's always willing and so whenever a new idol would come, whenever a new guy would come to Gomer, it'd be like, yeah, you bet, I'll do whatever you want as long as the pay is right. Do whatever you want to me as long as the pay is right. And she began to get these lavish gifts and she began to love the prostitute, the job of a prostitute. And I think there's a, a point in our Christian life where we recognize that there is a price for our soul that we're willing to pay. Pleasure, if you bring me enough pleasure, I'll commit that sin. If you bring me enough money, oh yeah, I'll, I'll give up what I ought to do for what I ought not to do. And in that same way, we prostitute ourselves to the things of the world. It's interesting to me that as you look down through the ages, lust is one of the greatest destroyers of nations, of people, of families. In fact, it says, don't love the things of the world, for all that is in the world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Lust is in there twice. And you, know, you go back to Samson, and he lusted after prostitutes and the women, and it led to his demise. He never repented. Solomon lusted after a lot of things, he ended up with a thousand, well, 700 wives and 300 concubines. And it says his wives turned his heart, backslide, his wives turned his heart away from God. Then you have Rehoboam who lusted after power and he split the nation. David lusted as well, but the difference there was he repented. But even recently, we've heard of how lust has destroyed major spiritual leaders and it's not uncommon. We don't, even, we don't even flinch when we hear that anymore. Because it's so common. Beware of lust. Is there something you are lusting for? Beware of it. God's love is pictured by a wife of whoredom. She's pictured as a prostitute. She's pictured as due. She's there for a little while and she's gone. So Israel was faithful to God for a little while and then she's gone. She's pictured as a hot oven that only cooks the outside of the bread, but inside it's still unbaked. Her heart wasn't fully true to God. And many of you maybe fall into that category where you say, hey, I go through all the right outward motions. I look like a wonderful loaf of bread, but my heart's not right. If you're looking for the references for that, as do is Hosea chapter six, verse seven. Hosea seven, verse four, or Hosea chapter six, verse four, says, what shall I do with you, O Ephraim? What shall I do with you, O Judah? Your love is like the morning cloud, like the dew that goes early away. 
Hosea 7, 4, he says, they are all adulterers. They're like a heated oven who, whose baker ceases to stir the fire from the kneading of the dough until it is leavened. She's also pictured as a silly bird, Hosea chapter 7, verse 11. Ephraim is like a dove, silly and without sense, calling to Egypt, going to Assyria. And the picture is, she's saying, oh no, I'm in trouble, I'm going to run to this. Oh no, I'm in trouble, I'm going to run to Egypt. Oh no, I'm in trouble, I'm going to run to Assyria. When she needed to go back to God. And how many times do we do that? Oh no, I'm in financial trouble, I'm going to run to working harder and making more money. Oh no, my... my uh, my wife and I are not having the relationship like we want. I'm going to run to pleasure to make me feel better. Oh no, my parents aren't treating me like I want to. I'm going to run to video games. I'm going to run to addictions. I'm going to run to lust. I'm going to run to these things. And we run to all sorts of different idols. The more I read Hosea, the more I studied it, the more I saw a picture of our heart. She's pictured also as a wild donkey. Chapter 8, verse 9. For they have gone up to Assyria, a wild donkey wandering alone. Ephraim hires lovers. You see what's happened there? The prostitute who was paid for sex is now paying for it. My dad used to always say, sin will take you farther than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you want to pay. In the book of Jeremiah, it's a disgusting picture, but it says that the nation of Israel has become like a donkey in heat. And the point is, the lovers don't need to find her. She finds them. And eventually, when you backslide from God, you don't need to be tempted. You go to the temptation. You plan, oh, my parents will be gone here. I'm going to commit this sin when they're gone. You plan, my spouse will be gone. I'm going to commit this sin when they're gone. And we begin to plan out our sin. Please repent if that's you. I know that some of you are struggling with it. I know you are. Please repent. She's also pictured as a withered plant. And I wonder how many of us are cheating on God. So the first picture is a wife of whoredom. The second picture is children of whoredom. Jezreel means God sows. That's their first kid. And it teaches us in scripture, you sow the wind, you reap the whirlwind. In Galatians, it says, whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. You cannot continually sow sin and expect not to get the results of sin. The reality is God forgives sin, but you'll still live with the consequences. I had a man challenge me when he knew about a sin in my life, and he said, you can choose your sin, and you cannot choose your consequences. Because what you sow, that will you also reap. And Jezreel means God has sown. Israel sowed, and then God reaped a harvest that they didn't like. Then they have another child, and her name is Lo Ruma, Lo Ru or Ruhama, and it means no mercy, that God no longer will have mercy on the house of Israel. And they have another child that means Lo Ami, which is not my people. It must have broken Hosea's heart to call his kids. Some scholars think that those last two kids weren't even his. They didn't even belong to him. And it must have broken his heart to call them. But then God's love is pictured as a husband of a whore. Hosea chapter 3 verse 1. Now she not only has become a prostitute, but she's paying others. And now she's a slave. And in Hosea 3 verse 1, the Lord said to me, Go again, love a woman who is loved by another man and is an adulteress, even as the Lord loves his children Israel, though they turn after other gods and love cakes of raisins or aphrodisiacs. God's love is pictured here as the husband of a whore who even though she's prostituted herself, he will go after her. And he, listen, even if your heart has turned from God and you know right now I have not been honoring God, God's love is one who pursues backsliding people. And we just have to say God's going to make the payment. He pays and he draws us back to himself. And there's also some of you who probably have never placed your faith in Christ. You don't know Christ as your Savior. The reality is we are separated from God because of our sin. But Jesus Christ is the payment for our sin. And God paid him to receive you to himself. And when you just humbly come to God and say, God, I am unworthy of my relationship with you. Please forgive me of my sin. Thank you for the payment that you gave for me. And you receive Christ as your savior. You're born again, scripture says. But some of us don't need to be born again because we already have been. But we need to return to God.
And there's going to be a cost to that. So God's love is pictured, first of all, letter A as a wife of whoredom. Letter B as children of whoredom. Letter C as a husband of a whore. Point number two, God's loving discipline. Really, chapters 4 through 10 are all about the discipline of God. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 8 says, If you are left without discipline in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. And I want to challenge you that if you have gone through your life and you are living in known sin and there's no sort of discipline, there's no sort of suffering that's coming into your life, there's no sort of difficulty that's been added to your life because of that sin, it is wise for you to say, have I even been born again? Because whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. And every single one of us that has been born again are a child of God. And he disciplines us. Just the other day, I had to discipline Elise. And parents often say this hurts you more than it hurts me. And I think the, the point is it not, doesn't physically hurt more. But the point is that you see what the child is choosing and you know it's the worst thing for them. Discipline isn't something that happens when a child is being obedient. And so for a Christian, God disciplines us because he sees that the sin that we're choosing is the worst thing for us. And Hosea definitely disciplined his wife. There are three more pictures in the text, or four more pictures. There's a picture of a jealous husband. Look at Hosea chapter 2, verse 2. Hosea says, plead with your mother, plead with her, for she is not my wife, I am not her husband, that she put away her whoring from her face and her adultery from between her breasts, lest I strip her naked and make her as in the day that she was born. I will make her like a wilderness and make her like a parched land, and I will kill her with thirst. Upon her children I won't have any mercy, because they are children of whoredom. There are three things that he does as pictured as a jealous husband. Number one, he takes away her security. That's in verses three and nine. He says, oh, I'm going to strip her naked. Verse nine says, therefore, I will take back my grain in its time, my wine in its time, and my wool and my flax, which were to cover her nakedness. And so he said, I'm just going to expose you. And in love, God often exposes our sins because he cares so much for us. And then he cuts off her outlets. Chapter two, verse six, he says, therefore, I will hedge up her way with thorns. And so what he's saying is, I'm gonna build a hedge of thorns around me so that she can't go prostitute herself. And sometimes God lovingly cuts us off from the very things that we prostitute ourselves for or to. And then he says, I'm gonna make her miserable. Look at chapter two, verse 12. This is not the typical marriage advice that you'll get. Although I did just recently listen to a podcast that said when you're, relationship is splitting you got to get serious and you gotta get serious like this chapter 2 verse 12 says i will lay waste her vines and her fig trees of which she said these are my wages which my lovers have given to me i will make them a forest and the beast of the field shall devour them chapter 2 verse 13 and i will punish her for the feast days of Baals, when she burned offerings to them and adorned herself with her ring and jewelry and went after other lovers and forgot me declares the lord he makes her miserable. And listen, God's love is too great to let us get away with sin. God has given us life and breath and everything. And so when we go after our jobs, when we go after money, when we go after sex, when we go after pleasure, when we go after any sort of addiction, we're saying, God, you don't give me all good gifts. And I don't trust you. And so God's loving discipline is pictured as a jealous husband. Secondly, it's pictured as a sad father. The names of the kids, you know, no mercy, God sows, no, not my people. I can't imagine how difficult it was for him to go through that. And so he's pictured as a sad father who's calling his kids that might not even be his. Number three, he's pictured as a trapper, chapter 7, verse 12. Israel's been described as a silly dove, right? Well, guess what? God is a trapper who catches that silly dove. As they go, verse 12 of chapter 7, as they go, I will spread over them my net. I will bring them down like birds of the heavens. I will discipline them according to the report made to their congregation. He says, I'm going to catch them. You're going after other idols. I'm going to catch you and draw you back. And so we see that God loves us enough to catch us in our sin. But he's also pictured as a ferocious lion. Sorry, that's actually supposed to be before that point. Letter C is a ferocious lion. Letter D is a trapper. 
chapter 5, verse 14 of Hosea, God says, I will be like a lion to Ephraim and like a young lion to the house of Judah. I, even I, will tear and go away. I will carry off and none shall rescue. And then in chapter 13, verses 7 through 8, it says, so I am like a lion. Like a leopard, I will lurk beside the way. I will fall upon them like a bear robbed of her cubs. I will tear open her breast. God terrifies his people at times. But why? And I wonder, have you ever been terrified of God? There are times I think God allows us to be terrified, and there's a reason for it. And Hosea allowed his wife to be terrified. He allowed things to be taken away from her. And the reason for it is you're in chapter 13 of Hosea, right? Chapter 13, verse 9. It says this. He destroys you, O Israel, for you are against me, against your helper. And in chapter 5, when he defines himself as the lion, the reason he says is, I will return again to my place until they acknowledge their guilt and seek my face and in their distress earnestly seek me. Sometimes God allows us to be terrified so that we will seek him. And if God is allowing you to be terrified, if you begin to fear hell, if you begin to think about your own life and it's becoming wasted, allow that terror to draw us back to God because sometimes God withdraws himself. He takes himself out of that intimacy that he wants you to enjoy so that you would remember Remember his love for you and remember that every good gift and every perfect gift comes from him. I would encourage you to write this down and maybe even commit it to memory. Whatever returns us to God is a good thing. Whatever returns us to God is a good thing. Even if it's difficult. The third point, if you would, which kind of covers chapter 11 through 14, is God's loving offer. The God's loving offer. The more I learn of God, the more I realize how otherly he is. And what I mean by that is he's not like us. It's interesting, he says, if they return to me, I will love them freely. Most of us, if our spouse cheated on us, and for those of you who have had your spouse cheat on you, when they cheat on you and then come back, your first reaction is suspicion. And you live your life in suspicion that they're going to do it again. But God actually says, I will love them freely. I think it's in Hosea chapter 11. Maybe not. Hosea chapter 11. No, there's a verse in there and you can look it up. God says, I will love you freely. And he's pictured as four more things. He's pictured as a forgiving husband. Look at Hosea chapter 2 and let these verses just speak to you. Hosea chapter 2 verse 14. Therefore, behold, I will allure her and bring her. This is verse 14. I will bring her into a wilderness and speak tenderly to her. I will give her her vineyards and make the valley of Acre which is where Achan stole the bacon and his whole family got killed. I will make the valley of Acre a door of hope, and there I shall answer in the days of her youth, at that time when she came out of Egypt. And in that day, declares your Lord, you will call me my husband, and no longer will you call me my Baal. For I will remove the names of Baal from her mouth, and they shall be remembered by name no more. And I will make for them a covenant on that day with the beast of the field, the birds of the heavens, and the creeping things on the ground. I will abolish the bow and sword and war from the land. And I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you to me in righteousness and in justice, in steadfast love and in mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you shall know the Lord. And in that day I will answer, and he says, I'm going to pour out the heavens. And then look at verse 23. And I will sow her for myself in the land. I will have mercy on no mercy. And I will say to not my people, you are my people. So in God's discipline, he came across as a jealous husband. And God's loving offer is, I am going to be a forgiving husband. God is not like us. 
If you come back to God, if you have re realized today that your heart is turning from God, you're going after other idols. First John 1, 9 teaches us, confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And I want you to know God's loving offer is return and I will restore the relationship. Return and I will restore the relationship. It doesn't mean he doesn't care about your sin. There's still going to be consequences for sin. But God desires to have that relationship with you. And so he's pictured, first of all, as a forgiving husband. Secondly, as a restoring father. In Hosea chapter 1, verse 10, he says, Yet the number of the children of Israel will be like the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered. And in the place where it says to them, You are not my people, it will be said to them, Children of the living God. And the children of Judah and the children of Israel shall be gathered together and they shall appoint for themselves one head and they shall go up to Israel or to the land for great shall be the day of Jezreel. Say to your brothers, chapter two, verse one, say to your brothers, you are my people and to your sisters, you have received mercy. He's a restoring father. Not my people become his people. So I have a question for you. Do you know for sure that you are one of God's people? And if you've turned your back on him, will you come back to God and may he restore you? And then I like this, chapter 11. Do you remember how God pictured himself as a ferocious lion? He flips it and he says, when you return to me, when you come back to me, I become a protecting lion. I've not been around that many lions, but I am sure that it would be nice to have lions as your protection that are trained to protect you. Hosea chapter 11, verse 10 says, they shall go after the Lord and he will roar like a lion. When he roars, the children shall come trembling from the West. They shall come trembling like birds from Egypt and like doves from the land of Assyria. And I will return them to their homes, declares the Lord. And so he says, I'm going to roar and they're going to come back to me, but I'm going to protect them. And then fourthly, he's pictured as refreshing water. Ephesians, or Hosea chapter 6, verse 3. Let us know, let us press to know the Lord. His going out is as sure as the dawn, and he will come to us as the showers, as the spring rains that water the earth. And then chapter 14, verse 5, he says, I will be like the dew of Israel. You remember, they were like the dew. They were here and gone. God says, I will be like the dew that comes and refreshes the ground. They shall blossom like the lily. He shall take root like the trees of Lebanon. And so as we wrap this up, I think it's been pretty long. I want to remind you of the big idea. God lovingly pursues his backsliding people. So I have three responses for you. Number one, return to God. Hosea 14, 1 says, return, O Israel, to the Lord. And I challenge you, repent of your sin that you know that is taking you away from God. Return to him. Young person, old person, middle age, whatever it is, wherever you're at, if your heart has been going after other idols, return to him. Secondly, put away your backsliding. Hosea chapter 14, verse 4, I will heal their apostasy. In the King James, it's backsliding. That's how it's translated. I will heal their backsliding and I will love them freely. There's the verse. I will love them freely. He shall take root like the trees of Lebanon. Oh, for my anger has turned from them. Sorry, I read verse five. But put away your backslide and then finally understand that everything good comes from him. Everything good comes from God. Father, you know those who are backsliding. I pray that you would reach them through your word. And may they remember that whatever draws us back to you is a good thing. Protect them in their homes. Be near to them, comfort them, but may they repent. I know there are many watching this whose hearts are not fully true to you. They're prostituting themselves and it's, it's crushing them. And I can see it in their faces. Not here today, I wish. But when I'm around them, I can see it. I can see the anger, I can see the bitterness, I can see the sorrow. Because their hearts aren't true to you. Cause them to repent and come back to you. And may they find that you are a God who is gracious and merciful and ready to forgive. Just like Hosea went back and loved Gomer, his wife, after prostitution, you will go back and love us after we backslid. 
So take your word and speak to your people in Jesus' name. Amen.